Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judith Dolcart. I'm the director of the Addison Gallery of American Art, and we are thrilled that you came out today and, of course, excited to have an incredible panel here today. Um, you all have uh, programs, so I'm not going to make formal introductions because uh, this is an incredible group of gentlemen here, um, and I think to, to enumerate their achievements would be the hour. Um, so I, I, I refer you to uh, your program. I do want to thank Boston Magazine um, for their incredible support of this exhibition. Um, and just from left to right, identify Jordan Schnitzer, Rick Axum, Frank Stella, and Ken Tyler. Um, and I am just going to dive right in. Um, so my first question uh, goes to you, Mr. Stella. And a little bit, uh, I thought for some of you, some, some people who are not um, as connected to the school. I'm wondering um, if you might talk a little bit about your time here as a student. One of the things that the show, I think, demonstrates is that your career has been one of risk taking and problem solving and experimentation. And I'm wondering if uh, there was a spirit of that in the art courses that you took here as a student. Well, it, it, it sounds a little bit like the only thing I did here was take art courses, but you know, <laughs> I, I remember playing lacrosse and sort of worrying about uh, how I was going to survive the wrestling meets, but um, and and whether or not <clears throat> you know my grade scores would be good enough to uh, keep my parents off my back, but uh, um, or whether I needed to be tutored or not. But you know the the whole experience of, uh, of of being a student here, and I was a student for a long time. It seemed at least I remember it as being a long time, uh, which was four years, and uh, uh, you know that's a pretty stiff sentence. And, <laughs> And so it, that it's all about art now uh, doesn't, you know, didn't seem to be that way then. And in a way, it, it doesn't seem to be that way to me now. I mean, I, I, I believe that I have some other life besides printmaking. And uh, <laughs> although Ken probably doesn't agree with that, or I shouldn't have one. <laughs> and uh, so, but the fact was that. Um, the program here, and the you know the the one thing that counts the most is the gallery itself, the Addison Gallery of American Art, and uh, I think somehow somewhere in there there was this idea that uh, if if you were interested in art and if you uh, might want to make art uh, and. I, I didn't think of it seriously as a career or something like that, but I did think of it, you know, I really liked doing it, so I'd be doing that. It was something about being an American artist uh, was, uh, seemed to be important, because the, this museum, uh, there was the whole other idea. There was art that was much more, uh, in a way, out there, or it's sort of important. I mean, great art, if you were interested in that. It's as though I wasn't interested in great art. I just wanted to make art or uh, somehow be an American artist. It was kind of somehow different from a, a whole larger problem or, or a larger ethos of art out there. So I think what was important was that the that there was such an, a sense of identity and, and special sense to the uh, Addison uh, Gallery and to the collection, which was, uh, you know, all of the time was so satisfying to be around and to be in. I felt into it, I guess, in a certain sense, because it was so available. That's an, that's an admonition for all of the current students to uh, dive into the Addison. Um, Rick Axum has written so powerfully and beautifully about the collaboration between Mr. Stella and Mr. Tyler. Um, he even noted, I think, in a, in a wonderful way that uh, the glossary for the catalog accompanying the exhibition is um, remarkable because so, so many new terms were invented out of this collaboration. And I'm wondering if you might talk to us, both of you, about how you started working together. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Tyler and Mr. Stella. <laughs> he well, made me do it. <laughs> yes, I, I twisted his arm and, and it was fine after that. 
Oh, it's been, uh, let's see, 50 years since I met you, and uh, 35 of those years we were busy making things. Uh, it, it's a relationship that I am very fond of, mainly because I spent uh, the major part of my printing career working with Frank, and that perhaps is uh, the best thing I can say, is that of all the artists I worked with, I spent more time with him than any of the others. Um, it seemed like favoritism to a lot of my other artists, except that they gained a tremendous amount from it, as I did, because we passed this information on as we kept experimenting and doing things that weren't done before. Um, adventurous in one way and uh, toiling in the vineyards uh, in another way. So I think that if we look at any one given period of time, uh, I look at the last 10 years that we worked together uh, as being the most magnificent 10 years because it seemed every rule in the book was broken and we seemed to pioneer a lot of new things together and we wound up making one of the largest prints ever, uh, the fountain, um, which was kind of like a culmination to all the stuff that we've been putting together throughout those years. But I, I found Frank a very eager collaborator in many ways. Uh, even though he doesn't like to admit it. He's, uh, he's very committed to uh, a lot of technique and technology that he claims he doesn't understand, but he does. Um, and I think that through the years, um, his contributions have just mounted to be so many that it's very difficult to pick one out. But I think um, when one looks at Rick's catalog resume, and you don't have to go much further, it's all spelled out there, and he's done a magnificent job of researching it. So I want to say that uh, we're kind of a triumphant here. Absolutely. So, Mr. Stella, you said that um, Mr. Tyler made you. What was the? Uh, what I was didn't the... say that he made me do it. But, <laughs> yeah. I, but 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 you know you're probably right. The other on, on, on that level too. So what was the hesitation and what was the ultimate enticement to begin? Well, there, there was no ultimate enticement. Um, that actually that was pretty organic. I mean, that, that developed as we worked. But in the beginning, I didn't much understand it and uh, what we were doing. And I was, uh, well, homeless in, in California, uh, um, ostensibly teaching and, and working there. And Ken came to visit me and said, you know, you're not doing much. Maybe you'd like to come to the print shop or come to Los Angeles. And if you're in Costa Mesa, you know, it's uh, even though we were on a house on the beach overlooking the Pacific Ocean where the uh, Martians landed. And, uh, but, uh, you, know, it was in, you know, I was happy to go to Los Angeles and uh, uh, to, to work and to see what the shop was like. And, you know, just, this is incidental, uh, I guess, because it doesn't focus exactly on printing, but uh, there was something about Ken and what was available and the print shop. And the other thing that uh, was the people working uh, and the way they worked and the way they did things uh, was was different. Uh, I was still, uh, and that later on I learned to work with others or, or do more things. But Ken also, the, the main thing was that uh, he, he had a lot of, um, I don't know, he was able to reach out to things like model makers and all of the things that were available, I guess you'd call it uh, technology or something, but uh, things like aluminum panels and uh, uh, very uh, skilled uh, model makers. Uh, that, that, you know, really changed my way of thinking about a lot of things, not just about printmaking. It was the availability uh, of things outside of yourself and your own ideas, and actually the, the physical limits of the space that you were working in, wherever you were working or whatever you were working uh, on or something, there was always something outside there that could either come in or that you could go out to that would make things maybe open up and take some of the worry and tedium away from it. So you would, it was the kind of always looking for a kind of freedom uh, out nearby, and Ken made that really available. And for Dr. Axum and Mr. Schnitzer, um, both of you have spent a lot of time um, collecting the work of Frank Stella and other artists and studying his work. What were the things that drew you to the work? Either of you. Don't you talk about your first experience? My first experience? Yeah. Okay. It's a great story. <laughs> well, I first encountered Frank's work when I 
wandered into the Museum of Modern Art in 1965 to see a show which I didn't know was going to be historically very important. It was called The Responsive Eye. Um, and uh, it was a, a survey of what the press would call op art. But there was Ellsworth Kelly, there was Frank Stella, and I saw paintings by, by Frank and I was really captivated. But in terms of prints, I have to flash forward to my graduate years in the late 60s. And in 1968, figures were before that, uh, a gallery of modern art opened in downtown Detroit. By the way, University of Michigan, I should get my location here right. Um, in the Hudson's department store, a gallery of modern art opened. And they really did bring in a, a, a number of prints by contemporary, contemporary artists. And those of you who were there, not there, or may not know, that decade would become known in many, many names, but it was certainly a resurgence of printmaking in an extraordinary way, where artists, established artists, working with master uh, printers, like these two, collaborated to produce extraordinary uh, additions. And they were available um, to undergraduates and graduates because they were not that expensive. Of course, that would change in time. Um, but I wandered downtown with some friends into the gallery, and I saw a Warhol, a Kelly, and a Stella. And it was Empress of India, number two, an extraordinary print. And I was just fastened on it for any number of reasons. But I think Jordan is wanting me to say, I bought it on my mother's plate. <laughs> and for those of you from that period, that translates into credit card later. Uh, <laughs> I promised her I would pay it off uh, in time. Um, which I did, but that's where it really all started. I taught, began teaching at the University of Michigan in 74. I really didn't come to Princeton until the late 70s when I was up for tenure and my advisor said, write an article, write an article, do something. <laughs> I had been collecting some prints at that point and Empress of India was in my apartment living room across from the sofa. And I'm thinking, what should I do? So um, I looked in the literature for anything, any text on Frank's prints uh, and there, were, there was very, very little it said, except I must say for Brenda Richardson's catalog of the black paintings mm -hmm. where she included the prints, mm -hmm. which really got me started anyway. Um, I did an article, uh, it was accepted, uh, and then the idea of an exhibition came up. And in 1983, um, uh, I'm sorry, 1982 in the fall, um, uh, Frank's uh, print retrospective opened at the University of Michigan. It went on to the Whitney after that. But by that time, I was certainly very, very hooked. But I guess I'm talking more biography than I am aesthetics. But I must say, I, I just fastened on, on, on Frank's abstraction in the 60s, a long time before I met him. Uh, and I was, I was enthralled. I was enthralled by the work, by the abstraction. Will that do? Yes. OK. <laughs> As the bio says, uh, I grew up uh, in a family where my mother opened an art gallery when I was in the third grade. And if there's probably the one thing all four of us, all five of us up here would say in unison, is for you parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, take your kids to galleries, take your kids to museums. And instead of just buying them toys for holidays and whatever, whether it's a $5 piece at the Saturday market, whatever, get them some art. Because just as Frank happened to end up with the Empress of Persia on his wall, and from there on, he was hooked. I was lucky, I grew up with a lot of art. Uh, the art I first collected was art of our region in the Pacific Northwest, I grew up in Portland, still live there, and I always talk about the importance of supporting local artists. After my mother closed her gallery uh, 25 years later and let someone else take it over, I began to collect prints of what I'll call the New York School, and uh, Frank Stella's was the first print I'd bought not thinking about him. I just saw the image. It was a purple triangular piece, and I loved it. And I uh, bought a hockey at the same time in the Jim Dine, and just loved it. And uh, because I'd grown up with a mother that had a gallery, we were used to having a lot of art around, and I went back and bought a few more and a few more. Some years later, uh, the Art Museum at the University of Oregon, where I went to school, asked if they could have an exhibition from the then 300 prints that I had. We had an exhibition in that wonderful space, and I was so excited about sharing the art that it even exceeded my passion for experiencing the art. So since that time, we've been on this journey where we've had 100 exhibitions like this at 80 museums, and there's just not enough room left in my heart for the joy of walking into this spectacular space last night. And as exciting and exhilarating as the art was, 
there were like 500 people who came. I was expecting maybe 100. And to see the excitement and enthusiasm on all those faces, I know it warmed, uh, warmed all of our, our hearts. Uh, so um, uh, Frank Stella's work, uh, uh, it's like each, each time I see one of his works, whether it's a painting, a print, sculpture, whatever, especially prints, uh, it's like I'm seeing it for the first time. And I'm just as enthralled and just, I, I'm taken on a journey. I look at his work and I get totally absorbed in this magical mystery tour. And I sit there uh, looking at how he comes up with these colors, these shapes, these forms. And I think what it all amounts to for me is the creative genius that he is. And what that really speaks to is the creative genius in each of us, in our own ways. He's gifted in his ways, but each of us have, have, a, have a, a genius in us in our own ways. And by experiencing his art, it makes me think that I can do a better job in the things that, that I do. That's how his art inspires me. I'm just nodding. Oh, you're nodding. <laughs> in agreement, what yes. Said because he, he captured it. He captured it. And, and I, I have to say, maybe I'm interjecting this at the not most appropriate moment, but just to say, when you come, and if you do come to know Jordan, he, I think of him as one of the great, if not one of the most important ambassador for, ambassadors for Prince. Uh, and he collects, he collects to share and to lend, uh, not to resell um, or put up as trophies, which is okay, I imagine. But what I like so much about it as, as a teacher is that what he wants to do is share to inform and to educate. And he has an exhibition and lending program which is unbelievable in terms of its reach. Jordan, how many exhibitions do you have out now? We've got uh, six now, 17 openings this year. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> so I just I, I just wanted to say that, and also, you know, you're looking at so many different varying collaborations up here, uh, and my collaborations with Jordan has been just pure pure joy because of his passion uh, for prints, which I think you can hear in what he says. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Stella. I'm curious when the first when you first started making prints, you went back to subject matters or themes that had been in your painting. And I'm curious, was that a way to, um, to look at those works again and continue the problem solving or con continue aesthetic or exploration with those themes? Um, I mean, they're not, they're, the way they're presented on the page, on the sheet, they're not just representations. They seem to be a continued exploration of those formal effects. Well, I think they were supposed to be <clears throat> basically a kind of drawing. Uh, and it was really a gesture. Uh, actually, Pat Morgan, my teacher here, uh, had a very simple but elegant uh, definition of what drawing was. He said, drawing is a gesture. And uh, that goes a long way, actually. It, and uh, I wanted to do something uh, because I was faced with the plate and the basic uh, tool, the, the lithographic crayon. So it was about marking and about making a drawing. But I had a, a, another idea, but I don't know how well it, it, it how it, it came to pass or how well it passed, uh, which was that I had a feeling, uh, I, which I just started there, but I was really interested in the paper. And, uh, and the paper in this case was like the paper for a drawing, basically a kind of page. And uh, the sense of holding the page and holding it and the drawing. And uh, actually these prints, I mean, you see them, they're framed and they're on the wall, but it was originally supposed to be a portfolio. And uh, you would uh, leaf through it and uh, see the drawings and, uh, and the imagery and be able to uh, handle the paper and uh, you know handle the ink in a certain sense too. So I think that's what it was about. I mean, it to be as close to the uh, process in the, in the kind of the most direct way, just sort of building my way up from there. And those early works are, uh, those early prints are small, um, but your painted work and relief work is very large or a lot of it is very large, and then your print work became much larger. Um, and so I'm curious about the, the question of scale in your, in your printmaking. Well, I think um, 
when we mentioned the idea that there was, in a way, a reproduction of drawing, so prints are kind of, I don't like to get stuck on the word reproduction. But anyway, since it's, since it's about drawing, drawing is the scale, and I'd say the easiest way to understand it would be if, you're, if it's a drawing, by and large, uh, and uh, the paper is, by and large, the size of a, a page, or it might be a, a size of a notepad or something, whatever it is, it's pretty much related to your hand. So it's hand, eye, fingers, and that's where the focus is, and that's where the gesture goes. Uh, that's how it's expressed. And over time, uh, the gesture moves, but the hand moves with the eye, as they say. And, but the big thing is that for all, almost all artists that work in one way, uh, it is mainly about hand-eye, but then, you know, what's, uh, you know, sort of the um, elephant in the room is the body, the artist's body, and it's the, the gesture has to be expressed uh, not just in terms of your hand and eye, but your hand-eye and your body, and so the whole, uh, all of you has to be in what you're doing to make it work, which is also pretty much any other activity of making something has to be true, too. So in the, our um, slideshow seems to have stopped, but, um, but in earlier images, you're literally in the plate um, as you're making it, um, which is very, very striking in that regard, and uh, working on the ground um, in making them. So I wonder if you talk a little bit more about the process um, working together in making the plates and making the prints um, and how you, how you worked on those. Tell them how you had to file it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've often referred to uh, Frank as the reluctant printmaker who became something other. Uh, in the Black series, uh, there were over a thousand lithographic crayon pencils that were sharpened wow. for Frank to draw those plates. And I must tell you, there were constant outbursts of profanity as the broken crayon took place. And it, made a mark that he didn't like, and he had to go back and make some more marks to kind of camouflage it. These were very difficult prints, I believe, for Frank at the beginning, but I think he took to it like a duck to water, and after four or five of these uh, small editions that we produced there, uh, it, it became something else. But to address something about the portfolio, uh, that was his original idea, to have them in acetate sheets into a black portfolio. And we did publish it that way, but all the portfolios wound up in the garbage can behind the frame shop because everybody framed everything. <laughs> and nobody kept anything in portfolio, so, so much for that. So we stopped doing that <laughs> as time went on. Uh, you know, it, uh, it became a, a series of work that uh, was starting to be recognized as a, as a series. And he also kept doing that, and so much of the work that uh, was done was always in series forms. And, and I think that's, uh, there's a certain power uh, to doing serial work in, in printmaking. And of course, Frank proves that with, through the years. And the work has often been in series in other media as well, so mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and Mr. Stella, in terms of the printmaking, how has that, how has working in that medium affected your approach to other media, like making reliefs or paintings or sculpture? Well, a after a while, um, it, it became, uh, things happened, but for a, for a long time, the, the sense of scale and the sense of gesture was, in, in a certain sense, limited. Uh, and so, uh, I think when I was trying to make the connection between the hand and the body and the, the movement, uh, one of the things that's hardest to find, I mean it exists and great printmakers and artists uh, are able to do it, but it's very hard to uh, find a, a, a real good correlation between what artists do mostly, which is uh, brushwork or working uh, or uh, larger gestures, to find that in the printmaking. Uh, it, sometimes it feels reduced and sometimes, but I mean, you know, there are monoprints and beautiful things at, at that scale, but it's quite hard to, uh, to see it really uh, move out. And the only thing, I, I, I don't actually know enough about print <laughs> printmaking to say, but the only things that I think are, are large, uh, but you have to correct me, with the, with the large posters, like uh, Toulouse-Lautrec and everything, that, that's large scale printing. Uh, 
but that was probably silk screen or whatnot. No, no, but that's true. In yeah. Large lithographs. Uh, yeah, as well. Yes. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. But you really, you really broke ground when you uh, did the 1973 eccentric polygons. That, that's really where I think you, you left the portfolio yeah. prints and went somewhere else. And, yeah, uh, but I struggled because I mean the the the, the crayon marking yeah, wasn't right. was never that right. satisfactory. Right. Yeah. And then it became the exotic birds where you started to do the brushwork. So there, there's right. a lot. That wasn't that great either. <laughs> <laughs> but we got lucky with the uh, uh, at uh, Swan Engraving uh, when Extremely we found lucky. yeah when we found uh, um, the routed uh, plywood, uh, which was uh, um, made. Uh, uh, we had shapes cut out of aluminum that we were building pieces, and uh, they had plywood underneath it where the uh, and the marks of the router uh, were drawing on the plywood. And I noticed one that was going to the same trash pile behind the frame shops at the, <laughs> at the print shops there. And I asked Ken about it, and I said, "Well, could we just ink the ink the board, uh, ink the plywood?" And he said, "Yeah, that that's a woodcut." <laughs> <laughs> We spelled everything out. <laughs> so, but so that was a departure in many ways because that was. Well, four by eight is pretty big for a print. My my idea of a big print. I mean, I was still had in my mind, and I was quite stunned by Booster. I mean, the Rauschenberg print. The uh, there was yeah in the 60s. It was there was nothing like it. Yeah. And that those prints, the Swan series, are a real departure because previously the work had. Um, did look back at the painted works, but this is really something in and of itself, born of the medium in and of itself. Uh, Rick, I don't know if you want to comment on that. We were, we were ooing and aahing over uh -huh. those in the gallery the mm -hmm. other day, so I don't know if you want to add something about that series. Well, the, you know, the prints initially have a fairly direct correlation to uh, Frank's paintings in, in, in form, shape, and color, and that, that relationship gradually loosens uh, where the prints um, of the 70s become, I would say, uh, another format for serialization. In other words, that pictorial idea has you know, migrated from painting uh, and into print media and is refracted through print media to become something increasingly independent in its own right. By the time you get to circuits and the swan engravings, it really is another ballgame. I think. Yeah, I, I think you have to start with the swan engravings With the first, swan engravings. Which are the collage yeah. plates. In, right, the collage plates. Yeah. Because with the swan engravings, um, you have something quite independent in terms of, of imagery. Mm -hmm. And also the introduction of, of etching and intaglio processes and, and, and collaged matrices from which to print and found objects introduced. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though it's a, a, another start. I mean, it's really quite a page In the beginning, one-shot printing. One shot printed, right? Exactly. For so, the audience' sake, it's uh, you may not know that, but we had a hydraulic press, uh, several of them, and one of the jobs of the hydraulic press was to make it possible to press almost anything uh, that you put on top of a, a board and ink it and press it in the paper. So it didn't matter whether it was flat; if it was irregular, it was fine because what came out of it was an embossed surface inked. And this fascinated Frank to no end. And as time went on, these embossed prints in paper grew and grew and grew until we pushed it into a envelope that included a convex dome that became the dome prints. And that was a uh, what 13 and a half inches of uh, of distance between the flat plane that it was on to the top of the dome. So we we pushed that that business of embossing and raising the surface. Yeah, and, and, and the, the swan engravings also introduce um, an approach that becomes fairly standard, and that is Frank recycling <laughs> a rejected scrap metal and, and, and print proofs to create with the proofs collages for prints and then for, for sculpture and, and reliefs, uh, and, and also to take scraps from the metal reliefs with which to, um, well, there's Frank going through, I, I, I imagine I never saw this, you know, this great vat or barrel of scraps from the paintings and choosing this, choosing this, and choosing that, and then going over and putting them down on a board, very quickly, by the way, I'm to understand, and hammering in glue and nails to create a collaged plate of scrap material. 
and then continuing on, and then eventually pulling mm -hmm. from that collaged plate. Mm -hmm. One hit, beautiful, beautiful print. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But I think all of the collage prints that followed, yes. uh, every, every one of them, was really just a uh, continuation of, of Frank's discovery yes. of how many pieces he could put together, yes. uh, given that he was uh, a pack rat and took everything home into a <laughs> studio. And uh, we got into the habit of making extra proofs always in the shop for Frank. And we didn't do that for every artist, but Frank got a lot of privileges there. Uh, and he took these proofs home and came back with collages eventually. And these collages became the proofs that we used to make the, the collage prints in the, in the 90s. But by the time we were through that period of uh, working with the, uh, the original pieces, collage together, the elements, uh, we had lithographs, we had intaglios, we had silk screens, we had uh, pieces of uh, dyed paper. All that was in a collection called Frank's Collection of Proofs. And it was in the back of the workshop, and it grew and grew and grew and got very, very big. And as he would bring his station wagon over to the back door, he'd start piling them in as he wanted them uh, for another collage he was working at at the studio. So we became privileged to see his work in the studio on a regular basis. And, he was privileged to take these pieces home and make new collages, and these new collages became the new prints. And eventually, in 1992, or 90, no, 89, um, he made a very big, large, significant piece called the Fountain. And that collage became the uh, matrix for what we finally made as a very, very large print. So it all paid off in the end. But we must say that he never stole from anybody else. He only stole from himself. <laughs> no, there also are his proofs. If I can just add, oh, I'm sorry. Just, I just want to add one note here. You may have inferred this from what's being said, but the, the, the work in other media other than print, the, the very method of approaching the image becomes very similar. Frank constructs his sculptures and paintings I think you can say, with with circuits and with and on in the Swan engravings, that you're sensing that in some way the print is constructed. I mean that matrix is constructed up through carpentry and everything to provide what will become the print. Yeah, which Frank says, making building the print. Right? Building the print. That's yeah. right. So we get a lot of phrase outs. Right. We, we we have no images. <laughs> What I'm, sure, what I'm just going to suggest here yeah. is what you just heard is one of the reasons why I think printmaking post-World War II is so exciting in this country. Because the prints have been around for 500 years. So the artists were made little etchings and things. But uh, post-World War II, the collaboration between uh, the amazing publishing houses like Ken Tyler and Jim and I where he was before and the, the, the dozen of them across the country and these artists resulted in things for us, the public, that never could have existed before. Uh, the way they were able to push technologically the envelope and do things on paper that never, ever, ever have been done. Before we end this conference, I want to say one thing uh, that uh, I'm always astounded uh, that the audience never really understands a great deal about the printmaking process and then really doesn't really understand the people that made it. And the printers are a group of people that are exceptional. It should always be mentioned. Uh, I've always said that Frank's team, he had 19 of them at one point, uh, that spend, some of them spend as many as 20 years working with you. And without their knowledge, much of what into those prints wouldn't happen. Yeah, I didn't feel like it was my team. I mean, I felt like they were telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a funny way, you were paying for it. <laughs> so it was your team. <laughs> Sure. Which is, um, I'm, I'm with a lot of relief and a sort of embossed effect and, and where your attic fits onto it. Where you, those are where you use the hydraulic front. Yes. Now, what exactly are you using to cushion the bed of the press as it comes down on it to achieve a good imprint? and get as much as you can out of it without distorting or damaging. Ah, uh, well, that, that's called trial and error. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we would spend uh, just not a day or two, but months uh, making errors uh, to get it right. 
uh, if it's a simple, like a swan engraving, uh, you just needed pieces of felt to kind of pack the, uh, the backing so that when the press came down, the two pieces coming together would squeeze evenly. Uh, when we got into the bigger and more advanced embossings, we meant to have moles made. And so we would make moles, a male and a female, and put the sandwich in between and then close the gap on the press. Well, domes and things. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. If that's clear. So that would have been a separate, a separate imprint. Uh, the dome itself. Yeah. Well, in the case of the domes, first we had to make the paper, and after we made the paper, then we made the shaped plates, and after we made the shaped plates, then we figured out how to print the shaped plates and the flat plates. Um, so that was a, a very complicated situation. Yeah, they're very impressive. And, and that took five years. So uh, we, we did not spend a lot of time not working. We spent a lot of time working. Uh, and only because Frank was able to come to the studio often were we able to do these complicated prints. Uh, other artists would spend a concentrated period of time and then leave. Uh, Frank never seemed to leave. He was always there. <laughs> and and that, that made a big difference to the kind of work that we were able to do. And uh, without that, and without the dedicated printers, you wouldn't see what you see upstairs. And so uh, that's why I had to bring that into the subject matter tonight. <laughs> Between the two of you, though, would suddenly, uh, uh, can you call Frank up and say, hey, you know, uh, it's time for a new series or new idea? Or would never. Frank suddenly call you? Never. Yeah, he's never, never finished never. what he was working that's on. That's right, never done on it. <laughs> Well, how would, how, would, how would a new series evolve? Uh, we never stopped working, so I, I can't tell you. Uh, we, it, it really, I, they, just, they just seamlessly go together in my mind. I mean, I don't, I don't know if Frank ever had a cut-off period for anything. Uh, well, once in a while things stop, but I, I think it's un, uh, unrealistic uh, to see one thing so directly following another, because uh, if you're working on something, um, you know, the, the notion of uh, additioning. Right. But we were working while we were additioning. And additioning <laughs> wasn't so sequential either. Yeah. You, know, you would be part way through it, and you'd be working on something else, and then you'd go back to it, and then you would be adding to it. Mm -hmm. So the process, although they, uh, they each have a different date, uh, it's really what's happening over a period of two or three years, the momentum of the ideas of that time. And, uh, and as uh, Rick can attest to this, we kept uh, very scrupulous documentation, mm -hmm. lots of documentation, a lot of photographs documenting and even in the filming documenting. Uh, that was essential both for us, uh, the makers, and also for the future people that wanted to look at this and say, how was that made? Uh, uh, Frank Stella print is not easy to explain, technically. Uh, you can tell how easy it is there. <laughs> yes, you can in the image up there. Uh, very good. I don't think that most people uh, would be able to carry this information over into their own activities because it, it takes a certain kind of uh, facility and a certain kind of uh, uh, practice, mythology, in order to make these things. And as we, as we kept making them, we kept recording it, and as we kept recording it, we kept examining it. And I think as time went on, except for two occasions where Frank said, after we released something, we had to bring it back, and he had to rework on it again. Those were two exceptions uh, that were absolutely within the framework of how we worked. So if there was a piece in one print that we were editioning, sometimes we would have two or three prints we were editioning together in the shop, uh, he would take one part from one piece and take it over to another and make another piece. Uh, this was wonderful for us uh, as printers, and I think also wonderful for Frank's uh, total body of work because it's very inventive. It's very precisely dedicated to his stream of thought at that time, <laughs> for whatever that was. And uh, we think that we gained a tremendous amount of, uh, of mileage from that activity. But when, when you when think of 19 people sometimes inking all day long to go to the press at the end of the day and get one impression, that's exactly how those last prints were made. Well, when he would rework uh, uh, work or for either of you again, was there some point when you would rework some work that, that you'd come to him and say, Frank, that's enough already, it's perfect, and he'd say, no, it's not? I mean, no, did, no, 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 Jordan, we drove our accountants crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't give up on anything. And whatever was possible for Frank was possible for us. We really put the 
the cart around and said, look at the artist is what's making the art, and we're just there to facilitate that. And we really believe that, and we really did that. And because we did, I, I think it gave Frank the extreme freedom to do what he wanted to do and, and get results that he was uh, looking for. Yeah, but I, I think also, you, it, you know, if you say <clears throat> that's not quite right or this could be better, uh, a lot of times it was the printers or you or everybody, if I even just had that idea of doubt, uh, everybody could see it immediately and there were plenty of good ideas for how it could be improved. Mm -hmm. Exactly. When you, when you see work upstairs in the galleries, Frank, do you see some work that you say, boy, I wish I could have added a few more gestural strokes here, there, whatever? As an artist, do you, you act that way or...? Well, if I did, I wouldn't tell you, but... <laughs> <laughs> I learned that lesson a long time ago. <laughs> uh. But with the, with the dome, and we see the machine right there behind mm. you, just went away. How did you, I mean, did you have to create a new way of spreading the ink? Because... Well, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> yes, we did. We, it's a, the dome is a five-stage printmaking process. Uh, one was learning how to make the paper shaped like a dome. So we, we invented a vacuum system along with Lee McDonald, our paper advisor at the time. Uh, to make that paper, we got through that all right. Uh, we were already mold makers by, by, uh, by tradition. We always made molds, so we knew how to make shape molds, and that was not a problem to put the paper in uh, for the embossing that would take place. Uh, then we didn't know how to make the dome. What Frank had, we'd made some paper domes for Frank, which he took to the studio and he made collages, and they were on the wall. And his idea was to, to do the dome plates fixed to a flat plane, so there had to be a flat piece. That flat piece was the engravings, and we printed those first, and we cut the hole in the plate, and then we went out and got magnesium spun into a convex dome. And then we had that etched. Uh, that took a long time to figure out how to do. Uh, but we uh, went to the books and found out through mathematics how they did a lot of this tin work. And one of them was where they took an orange and peeled it. And then the peels, when brought together, created this sphere. So we thought, well, we just don't bring them all together and we have, a, we have what we want, which is a convex uh, dome. So we learned how to etch that, we got that through. And mind you, we were working with Swan Engraving, which was a very generous uh, contributor to our work since, um, what, uh, the early 80s. Um, and then we decided that we were going to ink that um, along with the flat plate and put it into the shape molds with the shape paper, and voila, we'd have a print. Well, the first time we inked the, uh, the dome shape, the ink dried before we got to the press. So that didn't work. And so then we started to dilute the inks with various little homemade remedies that we had uh, for adjusting ink consistency. But then the ink would run down to the center of the dome as they were wiping it, so that didn't work. So then finally, the, the printers worked out a system where it was timed. They would put so much of this and so much of that into the ink, and they would get two or three hours of inking time before the ink started to dry so it get to the press. So this became a, a race to how fast they could ink the plates, get it into the press, put it into the wet paper. So all that seemingly looked like it wasn't going to, uh, to be a big deal, except that each and every one of these dome prints had different etched qualities to them, so we had to re examine the learning curve all over again. For every and through, single one. Right, for every single one. So it was trial and error. So we got it all done, eventually. And then in the end, there was only one that's Jonah historically, oh, help me with your titles. Regarded, I guess. Yeah, I'm getting old. I can't remember the titles. Um, can't really hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there was one print, uh, Jonah historically regarded dome, that uh, Frank was not happy with, and we had already sold five of them. So we brought the editions off, to, took the editions off the market, and then Frank designed uh, in silk screen and, and with stencils um, a lot of dots and a lot of uh, strokes. And the print is upstairs. It's, it's gorgeous. And so then we printed those, and that was it. So uh, it was one example where a, a little more viewing time um, 
gave Frank another idea. So that lets you another another variation. Another variation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it seems, you know, in a lot of the titles, um, there's there are allusions to horse racing and car racing, and you can see uh, interesting uh, connections between the kind of uh, technological innovation that you're doing to make these um, and car racing in and of itself. Is that do you see uh, sort of I don't know, a, 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 a kinship between auto racing and making these kinds of prints? Only that we used to race going to uh, <laughs> engraving In, and into getting you always done. had a faster car than I had, so we always won. But, the, but know, there's a risk taking involved in, in both of them. I mean, yeah, seems, paying the ticket, so yeah, getting right, your yeah. license. Yeah. Or losing your license, right. <laughs> uh, well, no, it's a part of it is, is that there's a team spirit in racing, there's a, there's a team spirit in printmaking, and uh, I think that's one of them. Uh, and I think also it just, uh, I don't know who came up with this idea that the, the race tracks and, and all those prints were about horse racing, but they were because they were named after it, right? And then mm -hmm. all, yeah. all the circuits that the were circuits cars. Yeah. cars. So all those names came into place. And everybody liked to play with that and say, you know, this is a faster one than that and make all <laughs> sorts of jokes, but, uh, you know. But there's it, definitely, I mean, in all of those endeavors, a lot of risk. A lot of risk. Yeah, I mean, uh, taking... yes, a lot of risk, and uh, you know, I, I think the risk factor is uh, is something that has been talked about a lot in in, uh, in the history of my workshop. Uh, I can only say that uh, it takes, uh, in some cases, uh, two people to take a risk, uh, and and Frank and I were not risk avoidant. We always took mm -hmm. them. Um, I think it's our nature. Um, and I, I think that um, the, the emphasis should always be placed on the art. And when one starts to look at you know, how one builds the print and how one gets it done in the end, uh, that's all interesting. But uh, I think uh, the proof of the pudding is upstairs, framed on Absolutely. the wall, and how it yeah. looks. And yeah. uh, that's, that's what's mattering. Um, I would like to open it up to questions. Um, and I'll give Jenny my mic. Dine asked a question about how much variation in inking is acceptable or allowed in, in an edition. It varies on the edition and it varies on the artist. Uh, in, in Frank's case, uh, we always gave him a choice uh, because his idea of, of looking at, at, a, at a printed sheet of paper was very complicated, I think, for us to understand. Uh, we never knew what he liked and what he didn't like, and uh, we always knocked ourselves out crazy trying to give him a choice. And as time went on, I think the printers, and, and certainly I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, uh, went overboard and, and probably presented too many ideas, uh, too many variations uh, that he could choose from. Uh, but he became more selective as time went on, so we're kind of saved by that. The standard that we set up in the workshop was always this is the model that we are striving for and everything has to come as close as possible to that look that quality uh, and if the artist gave us permission to make variants we would then label the whole edition as variants so if it was one over 30 uh, we would say that all 30 are different different in this particular way um, because there are plates are printed differently, with different layers of ink, different qualities were achieved. But basically, we try to hold to a rigid standard of this is the way it should look, and we try to make everything look just like it. Some artists love the variant idea. In fact, when we went to color woodblock printing with Helen Frankenthal, she fell in love with the idea that everyone was different. Um, and that was very strange, because she was educated in the old school where everything had to look alike. Uh, mm -hmm. So. I, I think that kind of answers your question. Yeah, I think also you should just uh, think about how it should look was your idea, not necessarily your idea, but uh, how it should look uh, had to do with how it was done. And the printers and you, it was sort of, would arrive at sort of how it worked. And uh, you didn't want to take, it wasn't just to make it easier, but it was what was, what it seemed to want. So you were asking a kind of fake question, asking the plate to tell you how it wanted to be inked. 
Yes, I have a question. Um, particularly in the, in the later prints, there seems to be a lot of reference to um, architectural elements and whimsy. And, um, and you talked earlier about structuring the print as you would like a piece of architecture. So my question to you is, which Frank came first? Frank Stella or Frank Gehry? <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but the more I even look at your earlier works with the stripes, it reminds me like of a walk down 6th Avenue to the skyscrapers where everything is in stripes. So I'm wondering, is there a conscious dialogue or is there just something in the creative air between artists and architects? Well, um, there may be something in the creative air, but I mean, uh, just historically, I guess, I don't want to overdo the story, but um, it's, it, the endeavor uh, of being uh, an artist or a person who's making things, uh, in the visual arts anyway, the fine arts have, you know, the tradition, at least since the Renaissance, has been, you know, painting, sculpture, and architecture. And certainly in the, uh, in the Renaissance, just about everybody could do everything. I mean, there wasn't, you know, the borders weren't, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't that, that absolute. Uh, most everybody, I mean, you know, we all look up to Michelangelo and he certainly could do painting, sculpture, and architecture without much of a problem. <clears throat> so I think that if you can, if you're doing one or two or three, it, it's not that unusual. And I mean, I just think of obvious things like, uh, I just, I don't know why it comes to my mind, but Courbusier, I mean, he used to get up every morning and paint. I mean, <laughs> before he made the architecture. And the paintings are pretty nice. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stella and all of you, thank you very much. I'm curious about your inspiration in, seri in series with titles, notably Moby Dick, where your inspiration brought to life so much of that saga. And can you describe how you were brought there and what you were expressing in your beautiful works? Well, I, I'm not sure what I was expressing. I know how I got there, and it, pretty indirect. But the idea was um, and not much uh, about Moby Dick. And it's in a certain way, you know, there's a kind of distance. I mean, I, I feel uh, not a, exactly apologetic, but I mean, it, you know, it's a little bit uh, tricky to, uh, uh, to sort of, you know, I don't know, I feel like it, it, I don't know that it's possible, but to embarrass Melville, but um, <laughs> if not myself. But um, I think the point is, uh, for me anyway, as, it, as it, it came about, it came about basically accidentally, in, as most things do. Uh, I was involved, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, on weekends you have to find something to do with your children, so we went to the, um, to the uh, uh, aquarium in Brooklyn, and uh, right at the beginning of the aquarium is a, is a big display for uh, the beluga whales. And they, I mean, it was spectacular, and they come sliding up to the glass and everything, and it's white, you know, the whiteness of the whale, and, and, but it's the movement. And it was the idea of the water, basically, which, you know, I did grow up on the water a bit anyway. Uh, and it's, but anyway, the waves, the, the shapes, and the moving of the mammals in the water or the fish, there's something about that kind of movement. And I think in whatever kind of art you're making, you always want, of course, vitality, but the vitality is most often expressed by somehow the illusion of movement. And so uh, I was interested, you know, in, in the kind of geometry, but geometry can be quite rigid and the circle and the, uh, and the square and everything. I mean, they are kind of tight, but the waveform, which is basic, basically a kind of topological form, it be suddenly became about surfaces. And uh, so I needed something uh, to sort of keep my interest in and, and to sort of drive it. And once again, you know, uh, one of my, uh, you know, I said, uh, well, I wanted to, I had the idea of uh, using the titles from Moby Dick, but then I said, you know, you know, there are 135 chapters or more, whatever it is, and that, that's kind of daunting. Where are you going to get that many images? And then uh, uh, they said to me, oh, you don't have to do them all. You can just, you know, do a few, take a few titles. And that sort of got under my skin, and then I said, I'm going to do all 135 or give up. <laughs>
And so what's interesting about that in the end, or at least to me, is that it is 135 images or 135 pieces one way or the other. But you know, it turned out uh, not to be the way I, I thought about it. Uh, it's uh, in, a, in one way very much the opposite of what we've been talking about, a series, one thing following another. But if you put them all together, uh, the 135 items, they're all over the place. Uh, much the way the trip around the world is all over the place. And uh, so it gave me a kind of freedom to do uh, a relief, a print, uh, a sculpture, uh, maybe a building even, or something, a pavilion or something like that. But it, it gave me a kind of working freedom that didn't have to be so tightly related. The work didn't have to exactly follow the work that came from before it. And so I could jump around with both the work and the ideas about the work. And in that way, I think it was, uh, um, you know, it was really a, 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 an, ex, uh, an experience of, of uh, freeing myself up and freeing the work up. And, uh, and I, again, I still feel a little guilty about pinning that on Melville. <laughs> but anyway, it helped me. Um, in some of the later prints, uh, including the Moby Dick series, I noticed there were some forms that reminded me of some of the uh, sculptures I had seen from the early 2000s and like through to today. And I was wondering what interested you in bringing some of those 2D forms into a 3D space? Yeah, I, I heard what you were saying, but I didn't get it. I mean, I'm sorry. Sorry. I didn't get the first part of the... So I noticed uh, in some of the prints from the 90s, there mm -hmm. were certain shapes that reminded me a lot of the shapes of the sculptures, um, of your sculptures. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what interested uh, you in bringing those abstract forms I'd, into a Some of them space. Are, are probably literal, but I mean, most of them are, uh, are, are a transformation of some kind, using the shape, but a gestural uh, version of the shape. It might be twisted or turned or something, uh, maybe taking it from a different angle. Uh, so they, they, there's no question that the, the vocabulary stays fairly basic in a lot of ways, but what you do with it and how you, uh, how you elect to uh, change it and work with it, that, that changes as, as you go along. And the idea that it um, ends up in uh, more specific three-dimensional uh, forms, uh, for example, sculpture, is not that unusual, but I mean, it, it's just part of it. And I think that was the point I was trying to make about the Moby Dick series, is that that, that became possible, that you could do something that was essentially three-dimensional and then have a very, uh, work on something that was very close to it, that was completely flat and linear, like a print. <laughs> Mr. Stella, uh, earlier you were talking about architecture and art, um, and the piece that comes to mind is the Uhulu, uh, now at MIT, and I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about how that, that piece, the artwork, which is really an architectural space, how, how it came to be or what your thoughts were. Uh, it was pretty straightforward. I don't know how it started, uh, but the idea is that um, we made some models, but we were very worried about uh, surfaces. And so there's a certain kind of limit to surfaces, and there's a certain kind of um, uh, flexibility. And what we were really interested in, and, um, and it was, I don't remember what the dates were and everything, but, but it was happening uh, in the uh, engineering and architectural world. There was a, 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 an interest uh, uh, in uh, minimal surfaces. So we made, uh, we thought of ourselves, it's pretty hard to have a minimal surface actually up against the wall uh, because that's already flat and the thing. But we could create surfaces, say, if you went uh, on, uh, in, a, in an angle, uh, for example, the walls here and the walls there. But uh, what we did was we, uh, um, we, made a, uh, we made a model and uh, uh, it was a right angle on the ground and then uh, we drew points up from there to support another another line. There was a line on the on the bottom, and then the line uh, above it was a curved line. And so, if you connect the uh, the surfaces from the bottom to the top, you get a, a minimal surface, uh, as in a soap bubble. And that was the um, and that was 
and then it, I don't know that it makes any sense actually what we ended up doing with it. We just arbitrarily applied uh, something like um, the uh, the uh, um, uh, surfaces from the prints uh, from some of the prints we made uh, that were quite complicated, and uh, so we made a very complicated painting on a on a on a surface that really wasn't interested in it at all. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question for Mr. Schnitzer and Mr. Stella about the work that you have in your offices or in your homes, your studios. Um, for Mr. Stella, if any of, the, of your collection of art, some of which you might have given to the Addison, like the Hans Hoffman, if any of them were particularly inspiring to you. And for Mr. Schnitzer, what do you live with in your home and your office, and how large is the warehouse space for your collection? <laughs> Let's hear that. Yes. Please, I want okay. As the warehouse space, you can ask Catherine Malone, not big enough. Uh, we have a, uh, about uh, 20,000 feet right now. We're moving into a 50,000 foot facility. Uh, so it's sort of a, uh, an issue right now. As to what I live with, I think that's a, a wonderful question. And whenever I'm with artists, I always ask them, what do you live with? Uh, in my house in Portland, I do have, uh, I had a piece up Catherine, what's the the flower one called? The 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 one I had the the Corbett in the living room that we is in the show. She doesn't know you. Anyway, it's, it's up there. <laughs> so one one of the pieces up there now was in the living room, and, it, and they they wanted it for the Frank Stella show, so it went down. We put another one up, and in my office I have a big um, from the Wave series uh, right opposite my desk. So I live with him daily. Uh, in my office and at the, the, the house. Uh, uh, in that living room, for instance, on the other wall next to it is the big Thomas Struth, the huge big digital print that he did, a series of taking photographs of people looking at art in Europe, uh, museums. This is looking at Michelangelo's David. I uh, love his theme there about, because for me, art is all about observing. Uh, also in that room, there's a, in the living room in Portland is a Lichtenstein sculpture, and then uh, across from the, uh, uh, the Stella is a, a Northwest Seattle artist, Kenneth Callahan, who's passed away. It was Callahan. wonderful. So it's wonderful to live with uh, uh, live with the art around you. Yeah, I was trying to think of Callahan, Morris Graves, and Mark Toby. That's and right. And Callahan yeah. was the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, yeah. No, but I could. Three. I remembered them, but I couldn't remember Callahan. Yeah. yeah, I knew. Yeah, they were big three. Mm -hmm. What do you? They want to know what you live with. Uh, well, I used to live with what's upstairs here now. <laughs> That was in that was my living room. <laughs> it's been transposed, but basically, I mean, it's simple. I mean, I I I, I have I mostly uh, exchange work with the artists that I like uh, over the years, and uh, and I buy a few things uh, that I like, and um, and the idea is again fairly simple. I, I live with uh, anything but what I make because I don't want to come home uh, at the end of the day when I'm tired and look at what I've been looking at all day. <laughs> so that's about it. I think one thing that's wonderful about uh, uh, Frank's work in particular is like the piece in my office. Uh, there's never a day when I look at it that I don't see it in a little bit different way. And that's if, if there was something about his work, it's uh, uh, it's the way, at least for me and I think for all of you here, the way it draws you in and continues to challenge you. And the combination of this one hand, this wonderful lyrical painterly uh, forms, and yet these geometric abstract mm -hmm. shapes and that tension between those two, uh, as if everything was just thrown together and yet in a brilliant, uh, like, like, like this wonderful disorder and yet very orderly. And I love, for me, the tension between those two themes that I see in so much of his work. Maybe just one more question? Oh, no. That makes this one an important one, then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it seems like you were uh, working with the constraints of the technology of printmaking and extending that technology to suit your wishes, and compromises occurred along the way. What do you feel excites you the most of the latest technologies that artists are using that you feel can extend the, uh, the boundaries of what art can do moving forward. To whom are you addressing that question? Is that I don't know. Whoever's 
got the best vision. <laughs> well, I, I, actually, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm tempted to answer for Ken. I think for both of us, uh, I don't know if the technology you're referring to is digital, but uh, um, you know, I think maybe that that may be the technology of the future, but uh, it's not the technology necessarily of our future. <laughs> but Ken can. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right on. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think there's a there's a problem that all creative people are going to face in printmaking in, in the near future if they try to use uh, the latest technology. Um, I refer to like the iPad technology that Hockney has pioneered. Um, in the end, um, you got to be very careful that it doesn't look like where it came from. Uh, so it's like, uh, uh, I, I, you know, the, the creative, uh, the nudging that one does uh, in, in printmaking especially, um, it, it all stays within the same kind of craftness, if you get what I'm saying. When you are controlled by the pixels uh, in, in digital printing or, or uh, uh, the, the uh, iPad, uh, situation, I think it's always going to look like where it came from, and and that's not very not very forgiving. But I don't think that means anything actually, except it's up to the people who use the technology and how and the imagery that they can create. But I think that uh, one of the things that that's tough with uh, digital printing is the uh, the tactility loss. Right. Uh, you know, it's not. Y y there's not much to touch. Or change. <laughs> you know, in our collection, we have about 250 artists, so uh, all the yep. big post-World War II contemporary artists, and the, the collection is all works on paper. What's amazing about these two gentlemen is, just think about happenstance for a second. So here, Frank Stella ends up at, uh, uh, at school here. He has an art teacher that inspires him. Uh, he ends up going to Princeton, gets a history degree. He uh, ends up going to New York as he's written, he had money for about two months of rent, he was still painting houses, and he's doing a black painting, and suddenly through good fortune he gets a, a show at a gallery, and then he gets into a 16 artist show at the Modern Museum of Art, and that launches his career. I mean, there were many other artists, I assume, that you know didn't have those breaks that are they as good as, would they have been as good as Frank Stell or not? Who knows? Part of it's circumstance in life. And then the amazing um, happenstance of these two gentlemen meeting each other and the chemistry they had. It's like a marriage. Uh, and when I've pushed... What kind of marriage? When I've pushed... When I've pushed Frank to consider doing some more prints, he was adamant, no. Once Ken Tyler decided to quit, that was it. Because um, I could love to see what he would do now. But what this combination did, this relationship, is it broke through barriers for, for dozens and dozens and hundreds of these artists that have come since in terms of the way they used paper, going beyond shapes, forms, the sculpture, whatever. And that was a magical thing of, of that circumstance of these two coming together and having that, that chemistry and enjoying each other and, 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 uh, and the team that uh, Ken Tyler put together when he was talking yesterday about some of these works and I was learning from him, uh, you, as he said earlier, you just cannot believe technically how complicated and how exciting it was for him and frustrating for he and his team to push that envelope and figure out ways to do things that had never ever been done. And therefore, it allowed this amazing artist to do things for us that had never been done on paper. And therefore, lots of artists that have come since have been, those boundaries were burst open. Uh, and uh, really, I think to, from all of us in the room and all of us, the thousands that see these shows and whatever, just such a, such a sincere thank you. What I was pleased with is that what you said, Ken, was for me, I put these printers and master printers on the same pedestal I put these artists. Now remember, they're all human beings. When we walk down from here, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble here, Frank's going to walk back and say hello to his wife, Harriet, and he's going to go off and see his nephews and his sister, and he's going to live his life just like all of us do too. He happens to have this creative ability that was able to be transformed in the works upstairs, <laughs> painting, sculpture, whatever. Just as I said before, each of us have our own gifts. The lesson from, for me from seeing people like this is, gee, 
what gifts do I have and how can I be more uh, productive and creative in my life and make a difference just as he is. And uh, uh, this was so exciting to have them together for me. It's like just a bunch of heroes, all three of them here. You've got the foremost art critic in the country. And uh, uh, amazing to have uh, been able to share the stage with, uh, with all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to add my thanks and uh, I want to add my thanks and just say that um, having all four of you here talking about the exhibition upstairs has been a dream and um, really I want to thank Jordan and Rick and Frank and Ken for making the exhibition possible. There are a hundred amazing objects to look at and bury your nose in and ponder how they were made um, and to just to marvel and to, um, to savor. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming and thank you all for coming out today and I hope you will um, come back many times over to see the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you.